Um, but yeah, welcome to the online rally uh, for the Global Week of Action for Climate Finance and an End to Fossil Fuels. And yeah, we'll be here today for up to an hour um, to speak around all the reasons why this is such a crucial, crucial week of action, all the different ways you can get involved and some of the some of the context as to why this is not just a single mobilization or single week of action. You know, this is all part of a of a wider global movement as we seek to secure climate justice. And we're really, really lucky to be joined by a great panelist of speakers today. We'll be starting um, with Astrid Rahman, uh, who's our direct executive director here at War on Want. And, um, and also the Climate Justice Coalition, who will um, speak around why these issues are so important. Uh, really delighted to be joined as well by Tasneem Essop from Can International, Climate Action Network International, to speak around the global context uh, and really explain how this is part of a, a wider movement and how everything that we're doing here in the UK speaks to our global movements. We'll also be joined by Sally Clark from Friends of the Earth Scotland to speak about why this is an important issue for movements in Scotland and how you can get involved there. And you'll hear from myself, Tara and Scott uh, from War on One around what the plans are here in England, um, how you can get involved and more about what the UK's uh, responsibility is as well. But yeah, I will pass straight over to our esteemed colleague, Asad Rahman, um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. And yeah, over to your side. Thanks a lot, Ty, and uh, great to see everybody, um, especially on what is, feels like a bit wintry, cold day here in London. Um, let me just start by, um, I was I was thinking about those final words uh, when the world's climate scientists wrote their last climate report. Uh, change is now inevitable. The only question is what kind of change? And of course, who's going to pay the price? And I think we can all see that change is all around us, right? 2024 is now the hottest year on record. Record after record has been broken. We saw lethal heat in India between 48 and 50 degrees centigrade earlier this year. And this is a country where 380 million people work in heat exposed conditions and who, unlike citizens of, of richer countries, don't have the option of air conditioning or of course, or of not working out in extreme heat. In China, whilst the North was facing an extreme heat wave, the South was being hit by record-breaking rains, thousands of people forced from their homes, and the continuation of the worst drought in 60 years, which impacted both food and agriculture. And if you look across the US, we, of course, we saw huge amounts of floods, eight times a typical average uh, rainfall in, in the Midwest, overpowering flood defences, submerging homes, hospitals evacuated, Mexico had a heat dome of over 51 degrees centigrade, recording the hottest day ever. And I'm sure we all remember that images of, 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 of pictures of, of monkeys dropping dead from trees while across South America, everywhere from Chile, which had faced wildfires and a year long drought, which has affected their water supplies to Brazil's uh, deadly floods. And of course, even here in Europe, where over the summer we've seen heat waves and fire wildfires of, and temperatures of over 48 degrees and in the uh, in Saudi Arabia over a thousand pilgrimages died during the Hajj uh, as temperatures hit over 50 degrees centigrade creating what many called uh, a death trap and and across the Caribbean we've seen supercharged hurricanes uh, hitting countries such as Grenada, de Grenada, destroying homes, roads and buildings. Everywhere, the climate violence is amplifying all of the injustice and inequities that we know are built into our uh, current economic and political systems. And it's the poorest and the most vulnerable who are paying the heaviest price. And of course, at this very moment when we need global solidarity and global action on this, we see many countries trapped in crippling uh, debt, uh, cycles of debt, forced to pay more of their precious finances to service unjust debt repayments to governments and banks of the global north, even as they're forced to cut the very public expenditure needed to protect their own citizens, such as around health, um, or build the resilience of their societies. And this is, of course, a consequence of trade rules and relics of colonial exploitation, which has forced many of those same countries into producing cash crops or exploiting the very res natural resources, and including fossil fuels, which are which are causing 
this huge violence. And and of course, they have to do that because the, uh, it's only for, for foreign currency and foreign dollars uh, that they have to buy the food to for their own people. We saw incredible situations. So, for example, in Kenya, which is a huge producer of cash crops and particularly food, having to still import 75% of the food for its own citizens because of the trade rules that they're governed for. And, and of course, all of this in the midst of what we're calling a cost of living crisis, but it's really a cost of greed crisis because of the profiteering of corporate giants that has led hundreds of millions more people being unable to afford food, not just in the global south, but increasingly also, of course, in the global north. And we have, of course, and even here in the UK, um, in the last couple of days, we've seen the debates around uh, 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 tax here and who should pay the heaviest price. Uh, and of course, it's not uh, the super rich or big business. Uh, they account for, because of the loopholes and the rigged economic system, that the billionaire class and the millionaire class have increased their wealth by trillions, while of course, uh, extreme poverty has deepened. Now we have half the world still barely able to survive, let alone thrive. And as the UN Secretary General said, the jury has reached a verdict and it's damning. This has been a litany, litany of broken promises and a file of shame. And we're currently heading towards a warming of the planet of at least three degrees. Inequality is widening and we're destroying the very ecosystems in which we rely on. And, and extraction, whether it be for fossil fuels or the so-called green energy, which is poisoning land, water and air and displacing millions, isn't actually dealing with energy poverty or energy uh, for the many half the world that has been deprived of either access to electricity or clean cooking. And of course, the North continues to consume more and more of the world's resources and while telling the poor uh, to survive on less and less. And these politics of these sacrifice zones of sacrifice people, we know connects a thread that goes back through history from slavery, colonialism, to neoliberalism and to this climate violence. And, and of course, it's so embedded in our economic and political systems. Um, and of course, um, I'm conscious of the time, at this very same moment, we are all seeing what the, on our TV screens, the live genocide that is taking place in Palestine and the complicity of governments like the UK and the US who never question that they cannot afford the bombs and the bullets that take people's lives, but yet it's austerity and cuts for public services and empty coffers for climate. And we have always known, and especially as war and want, we've always said poverty is political. The poor are poor because of political decisions. And climate violence, like poverty, is not natural. It's a result of our economic and political systems. It's designed to do that. And it's a design that has taken so much wealth out of the global north, I mean, out of the global south, 152 trillion in resource extraction, 192 trillion in carbon colonialism, 242 trillion in exploited labor and land. So the figures are absolutely incredible. And yet the scale of resources that are needed to tackle the climate violence, whether it's to mitigate against and cut our emissions, to allow communities and societies to be able to adapt and, 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 and thrive, or to be able to pay the costs of loss and damage and transition to a fair, just and equitable and ecological based societies are far beyond the ability of many, many countries. And that's why the thread that runs through everything at the moment is the question of finance. And it's a question of finance, which isn't simply about climate. It's a question of finance in our, how do we protect our ecosystems? It's a question of finance when we say we want to tackle poverty and inequality and address issues of hunger. And of course, there are many, many uh, sources and needs for this. We as the climate movement, and it's great to uh, touch names here between the climate action uh, Network International and the Global Climate Justice Movement have now rallied our collective forces and are calling for a real accurate measure of what is needed um, to address these issues. And that is five trillion a year. And whilst that number sounds a lot, I'm hoping it doesn't sound a lot when we're talking about the trillions that are already being uh, taken out of uh, the hands of the poor or, or, or the poorest countries. And we can see that by the shocking announcement that we are going to see our first trillionaire within the next 10 years, yet it'll be 250 years at current rate before we eradicate any semblance of extreme poverty, let alone poverty. So we know we have 
a crisis, but we also know we have solutions. And some of these solutions are being debated at this very moment uh, about a UN tax system to make corporations pay their fair share of taxes, wealth taxes, so that the richest trillionaires and billionaires can pay. Even just 2% uh, uh, wealth tax would raise hundreds of billions um, much needed for climate fi finance, as well as eradicating poverty. And that's as true globally as it is here. We know we can redirect the billions that go into subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and to big agribusiness. And of course, redirect the trillions that are spent on military spending all around the year, all around the world. This is a moment where for us, we can tell a very, very different story. A story not of just what, of doom, but a story of the vision of hope that says we can do these things we, if we have not just the political leadership, but of course the finance and technology to go behind it. And it's in this moment that the global movements are coming together and telling one strong story that this is a climate fi finance fight. It's the fight that underpins all of the fights. Without winning on climate finance, we're never going to be able to tackle either the climate crisis or transition our economies and societies fairly. And I hope I stayed under the 10 minutes for you, Ty. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, I said. Um, not just for staying perfectly within your 10 minutes, actually, uh, but also giving such a, such a clear explanation and reason as to why this week of action is so important. So now we can hear about all the different ways you can get involved. But before we speak about how you can get involved here in the UK, I'll pass over to Tasneem to explain more about this global week of action and what our movements are doing across the world. Over to you, Tasneem. Thank you very much, Ty, and greetings to everybody. It's always exciting to join UK movements and to talk about our collective fights. So what I'd like to do, pivoting from the context setting that Assad has done, to, to talk a little bit about this fight and how it links to the fights that have come before us. So you might recall that over the past few years, movements globally across the world have united to take on very big fights that in fact we didn't think we were able to win but we needed to win so for example the first time we decided to take this approach of what we call escalating some of these big fights in and in a way to actually use our collective power across the world to win these fights and demonstrate that through our unity, we can actually win. When we started that approach, we in fact started around the Glasgow COP and we managed to put the issue of loss and damage as the key fight we were fighting that year for the COP. We put it on the agenda, even though it wasn't on the agenda. And in fact, this issue, in f since the start of the UNFCCC negotiations, so more than 30 years, was never resolved. It was an issue that especially the rich nations just did not want to negotiate uh, uh, in good faith. In any case, we decided that's our fight. We united and we made progress. In fact, it didn't happen in Glasgow, but the very next year at the next COP in Egypt, we won the loss and damage, the establishment of a loss and damage fund and that was an awesome victory and no matter what anybody wants to say we believe with uh, much modesty that it was the movement's power on that important fight and important especially for those who are suffering the worst impacts of climate change the next fight we took on of course was the global fight to end fossil fuels again big mobilization in fact, the September Global Day of Action last year was also huge. And across the world, people united and took that over 650 people, sorry, 650,000 people participated in those uh, that Global Day of Action, demonstrating our unity. And it resulted in a form of victory at the COP itself, this pressure that we brought to bear and we had for the first time ever in any COP decision an agreement by governments to, transi to transition away from fossil fuels. A bit weak in terms of the outcome, but at least 
precedent setting in that COP decisions have never addressed the issue of fossil fuels. This year is the finance, climate finance year. And the COP, it's the main agenda on the COP in Baku. And so we've decided that this is the big global fight we want to unite around uh, this year. And it's important to, to understand that, as uh, Asada said, we decided to frame this fight for climate finance uh, within the climate debt that is owed by the global north to the global south, exactly because the kinds of terms of engagement that the global north is putting uh, on the climate finance discussion has been extremely uh, lacking in ambition, avoidance tactics rather than addressing what they're going to put on the table in terms of finance. And still, you know, the notion that we can talk about billions instead of the trillions that we need to, to, to get uh, commitments around and certainly trying to shift the responsibility away from governments and looking at private sector investment and looking at developing countries contributing towards climate finance, et cetera, et cetera. So certainly this year is going to be very heavy fight. And so it was in this context that we again took on this fight as a global fight. Uh, beside CAN and uh, uh, DCJ, we have all the other movements involved in climate, uh, well, sorry, in finance system change. So the debt justice movement, the tax justice movement, those working on false solutions, those working on militarization, et cetera, et cetera. And we have all the constituencies the women and gender, the trade unions on board, we have the youth on board. And so it's a very, as with every other year, very, very broad movement doing that. And we're really excited that the UK is going to come up with the most amazing actions in that week of action. So let me just take you through the... Um, through the plans for that week. So the week itself, is uh, starting, in fact, this Friday, the 13th, and will end on the 20th of September, a week long, uh, uh, a week of action. What we have so far is 322 actions have been registered already, and I'll talk about uh, how that process has happened. Over 200, we expect, and we're hoping actually that this is very conservative, but at least 240,000 estimated participants in the, the week long of actions in over 100 cities in the world across 50 countries. So in all the regions, Africa, Asia, Asia, Europe, Latin America, the US, etc. there are actions being planned for that week. And these actions range from mobilization on the street to, you know, uh, very creative things like uh, theater, so there's cultural events, there's webinars, uh, all kinds of community events, etc. So very creative spread of actions, activities people are taking across the world. And as I said, in many different countries and cities, Bolivia, Mexico, uh, Peru, Brazil, in Africa, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, etc. In Europe, in Spain, Germany, um, we also have Japan joining us and the US and of course the UK. Um, there is a website that has been set up where you can see all this information, you can register any action that you're going to be taking and that will be mapped out so that people can see where actions are taking place and that is the website's address. Now the Global Week of Action is, is a, a drumbeat of action actually and as I said it starts on the 13th of September, this Friday, and the first focus of action will be the continuation of our global fight to end fossil fuels. And if you recall this from last year, fast, fair, forever. And so certainly carrying on with that fight into this year, making sure that the global fight to end fossil fuels remains uh, uh, on the agenda and that we create momentum behind it. It's, of course, going to probably continue in next year as well. So watch out for that. And then during the week, we have 
days dedicated to particular themes. So Just Transition, the international financial institutions and MDB's transformation, tax justice on the 16th, full solutions on the 17th, and then, of course, debt justice, demilitarization, and then we end up with a very big focus and actions across the world on payer, on the payer uh, campaign. So certainly that's the drumbeat of actions for the week. And so just to say again, we have this website, the address was uh, put there uh, for you to look at, and it's also available in around a hundred language uh, social media content is also available. We do encourage you to please whatever actions, whatever themes you have to also include the general um, unifying hashtags of end fossil fuels, uh, uh, hashtag fast, fair forever, hashtag as well. And, uh, you know, there is a, a comms pack that has been shared with the movements. It's available as well for you to adapt and fix for your local context and how to participate. Of course, um, you can organize your own action, join an action near you, post messaging around it aligned with the different themes. You can take part in digital actions or, uh, you know, you could also just amplify the social media post, uh, posts that will come out during that week as well. So that's the plans. We are all geared up for this. We look forward to hearing what you will do in the UK. Very excited about that. But please remember that you are part of a global um, movement and uh, all of us standing in solidarity for this Global Week of Action. And we appreciate all of the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, um, Ty. Well, well, thanks so much, Tessie. Um, That was brilliant. And I think it's just really important for us to hear that when we are organising these actions here in the UK, it is part of a, of a wider movement and that real importance of, of global solidarity. And I'm just going to get my screen up and, yeah, I guess speak about what we are doing here in the UK, um, but also a bit, of, a bit of why we're doing what we're doing in the UK as well. Now, this slide, the picture is not necessarily too relevant, but it's just to make sure you don't have to just, just look at me. Um, but yeah, this is such an important week of action and it's so important that we stand in solidarity with all our global movements and partners because our political and economic system is built on inequality, injustice and fossil fuels. And that means for centuries, rich countries, the corporate Operations they house when exploiting people and the planet for profit, no matter how much it harms the rest of us. Now, this has fueled climate breakdown, devastated the lives and livelihoods of people all across the world, but we know none more so than those communities living in the global south. And not only are they facing the most devastating impacts of the climate crisis, they're then den routinely denied the right to move safely or the resources to protect their homes. And the UK government's reliance on oil and gas is worsening climate breakdown. But it's not only worsening climate breakdown, it's driving up our energy bills here at home, contributing to a cost of living scandal with the poorest in the UK hit the hardest. And the UK is already the second largest oil and gas producer in Europe, yet we're still seeming to be opening their doors and encouraging new oil and gas production across the North Sea. But now we do have a new government in place. And with this, we need to raise pressure to ensure they are making adequate commitments to tackle the climate crisis. Now, this new government, they might be better at saying the right words sometimes when it comes to climate, but their actions have to speak louder. The new government must make sure that the Rosebank oil field never sees the light of day. Now, this huge oil field, which will be off the coast of the Shetland Islands in the North Sea, will produce over 500 million barrels of oil in its lifetime. And that's going to equ equate equate to the annual greenhouse gases of the 28 lowest income countries combined. Now, Labour needs to go further than drop in the opposition to the judicial review, which was raised by campaigners, which is a brilliant first step, step. But we need to ensure that Rosebank is scrapped. But it's not just about the new licences. We need to close our existing polluting infrastructure, such as Drax Power Station in North Yorkshire. Now, Drax reported in their annual report two years ago, that they emitted 12 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere, which makes the power station the UK's single biggest source of carbon emissions. So we need our new government to make sure that it's not just words and those actions speak louder. 
because wealthy countries in the global north, including the UK, long made big promises on tackling the climate crisis, but have so far continuously failed and failed again to deliver the resources needed to honour them. And those who are facing the worst consequences of our reliance on fossil fuels and polluting industries have done the least to cause a crisis, but face the worst effects. And against this backdrop, the UK is refusing to pay its fair share in climate finance and reparations to help countries adapt to and mitigate against, against a crisis they have not caused. And they can't sit by on the excuses that other countries aren't paying their fair share either. The UK has long professed to be a leader on climate. So it's now time that the UK steps up and acts like a leader. And that's why this week of action is so important. And that's why we continue this momentum forward through to COP and beyond. Because the UK's climate debt it's estimated to be in excess of £1 trillion, calculated from the share of all-time carbon emissions and the benefit a country's reaped and the damage it's sown. Now, this might seem like a big figure, but as we heard before, so much is extracted from the global south to the north every single year by corporations, banks, richer global north governments. So paying off this climate debt means the UK prioritising doing its fair share, stopping further harm, funding repairs to reverse the harm already done, and compensating for the damage that cannot be repaired. So we're calling for governments across the world, including the UK, who should lead on this, to commit to ending our reliance on fossil fuels fast, fair and forever. We're calling for a just and equitable transition that protects the well-being of people and planet rather than the profits of a few. And we're demanding that the UK takes responsibility by paying climate finance to countries in the global south. We need a new way forward and the UK must take decisive action. And that's why we are really putting so much behind and ensuring that we are taking actions across this week of action for climate finance and a fossil free future because the UK historically as we know is so responsible for so many of our injustices across the world for our legacies of colonialism extractive capitalism and legacies of oppressive systems so we have a responsibility as a nation to step up and do our fair share and as residents and as movements within the UK, we have to stand in solidarity with our global partners. And that's why we're taking action in the UK. But this is not something that's just come out of nowhere. This is a continuation of previous actions and not just these two campaigns. We've been a strong history of taking action here in the UK, strong history of our movements coming together to stand in solidarity with our global comrades. But even just on the paying up and the end fossil fuels, you know, over the last year, we have been out in the streets. Last year, we had an incredible mobilizations up and down the country to end fossil fuels with actions all, all across all across the country in towns and cities. And earlier on this year, we took to the streets and took our message straight to Downing Street, why the UK must pay up for climate finance. So this is really building on the momentum we've already started with and continue to see it grow and grow. So this is where we are now. We have a set of actions in the UK that you can get involved in, but you can also still find time to host if you're in an area where one of these actions, um, where if you're in an area where there's not an action currently taking place. On the 13th of September, we've got two actions in London, one of which is going to be a large scale stunt to start off the week of action um, in which we're looking to get some some good coverage um, and really get our messaging across strong and clear. The full details of this aren't um, shareable at this point, but hopefully by 9 a.m. on Friday morning, you will all see um, what we have done to send the message that we must end fossil fuels fast, fair and forever. Later on that day in London, we'll be outside the Equinor UK headquarters um, to campaign and hold a vigil there to stop Rosebank and really push forward that campaign. Um, in, in, in Bradford, there'll be an action on the 13th of September again outside the West Yorkshire Pension Fund to really push forward those demands that we dive, that the pension and local councils divest their investments from fossil fuels and other damaging and harmful industries. In And in Edinburgh and Stirling, we have actions that I'm going to let my esteemed colleague Sally speak on as well. But it's not just in the 13th, as we saw the other theme days in between. And in Liverpool on the 17th of September, we have an action as well. Now, we may have a very, very unexpected last minute special guest here on the call that I might be able to bring in to speak a bit more about this. So I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to try and bring in Katie. Have you been allowed to talk? Can you speak a bit more about Liverpool? Oh, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you good. 
Okay, yeah, so um, we're going to be outside Barclays Bank in Liverpool on the 17th, which is the day that's focused on green washing. Um, we're targeting Barclays because of their investments in Drax, which Tyrone's already spoken about. Um, now, Drax, as I think you mentioned, is the, uh, it's the UK's biggest carbon emitter. It's also the world's biggest tree tree burner but Barclays is trying to use Drax to greenwash its portfolio we know that Barclays is a big investor in fossil fuels and that's a big problem but they're trying to claim that they are putting some finance into green technologies by using Drax as an example and I apologize about the background music and I can't turn it off I'm afraid um so we really need to highlight that Drax isn't a green solution to to the fact you know to to finance um and it, you know the finance industry, and um we're gonna be strongly encouraging people to call on politicians to drop um the subsidies that Drax currently receives for this. Um, it's really important that we highlight these green solutions. Drax used to be in coal; it switched to biomass. As, as a green solution, but all it's done is maintain the status quo. Um, Drax does mainly source from the Global North, but the communities that are impacted in the Global North are poor black, brown communities, for example, in the Southern US, where they source the majority of their wood pellets, and um, where those pellet mills produce health impacts. And by um, relying and believing in these false solutions, what we actually do is we maintain the current economic system that harms the poorest and benefits the richest and we don't actually address the climate crisis so um, we think it's really important to head head this off that these solutions they're not solutions they're dangerous and we'd really welcome anyone else who wants to do some greenwashing actions on the 17th um please do get in touch um we don't want to campaign really hard to get rid of fossil fuels only to find our efforts ends up in all that for those resources going into other planetary harmful um, energy sources and technologies that, that harm people and particularly poor people in the global south and well poor people everywhere so thank you <laughs> thanks so much katie and um yeah for an incredibly last minute um last minute contribution to this that was fantastic well thank you so much for, for bringing that in at um, such such late notice and yeah I won't go on too much because I'm the one keeping time and I'm going over myself um, but yeah we have, a, we have a wide berth of action the map is still not fully populated we're expecting to add Nottingham on the map Manchester on the map and Glasgow on the map in the coming 24 to 48 hours so the hope is it will continue to be populated and just to give a bit more context um, as to what we'll be doing in London a bit more explanation too we are really mobilizing folks for the 20th of September to do a demonstration around paying up for climate finance. We want to bring together multiple groups, organizations and activists united against a common target. And we're going to start our rally outside the headquarters of Shell. Um, I mean, there's so many reasons as to as to why we started Shell. I mean, they're responsible for driving, uh, their actions are responsible for driving so much um, of the impacts of climate change and ecological devastation, uh, devastating communities, um, non well, frankly, so much so, especially in the Niger Delta and silencing those who dare to speak out. So we're going to start our rally there because we want to make sure that any opportunity we can to highlight this with the landmark court case due in 2025. Um, and whilst um, they are a corporation, we still want to make sure they are holding the nations that ho house them to account as well, a demand that they make their commitments to pay climate finance. So we will start our rally outside of Shell and we will take that message across Westminster Bridge and head to Parliament over that 10 minute walk and really set, spread that message and send that message that rich na nations and corporations have fueled the climate crisis and they must pay up for the damage they caused and we want this to be a building block for cop 29 as with all of this because our movements need to continue working together our groups need to continue working together around that, those common targets and those clear common messages so we are hoping that all of this organizing is going to be a stepping stone into our our wider movements actions around cop 29 and very quickly and how you can get involved, although I'll leave the slide up again at the end, but please do scan this QR code to come onto our UK site or the URL there on the Climate Justice Coalition website. 
please do join a local action. However, even though it's still very close, the week of action ends next Friday. If you want to host an action in your local area, please do get in touch. Contact me on the email address below. Email the um the email back from the um from the from the webinar from the invite for this online rally but yeah please do get in touch we can help support it help give you ideas provide some some small funding to make that possible um so as you saw in bradford the west yorkshire divestment um campaign that can be repeated outside any council office or the vast majority um they'd be hard pressed to find too many councils that don't have investments of their pension funds in fossil fuels and often arms as well so any of these actions will help support sign the online petition which is there on that website for the qr code do post online do share the posts online looking for the two hashtags end fossil fuel and pay up or do contact me on tscott at war one.org but um yeah i've absolutely gone over my time so um i'm going to stop sharing my screen and i'm going to pass over to sally to speak around the actions uh and the campaign in scotland thank you so much tyrone that was incredible it's really wonderful to be here with you today. My name is Sally and I'm the divestment campaigner with Friends of the Earth Scotland. And I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Get into slideshow. Okay. So we are so excited to be part of the Global Week of Action for Climate Finance and a Fossil Free Future. And I'm just going to say a few words about why this Week of Action is so important for Scotland and how you can get involved. And a quick introduction to Friends of the Earth Scotland. We're campaigning for a world where everyone can enjoy a healthy environment and a fair share of the Earth's resources. And we're calling for a just transition to a 100% renewable and fossil-free Scotland. We're also part of Friends of the Earth International, which is the largest grassroots environmental network in the world. We have 73 member groups and millions of supporters. And it's incredibly important for us to be taking part in the Global Week of Action for Climate Finance and a Fossil Free Future, because as one of the world's first countries to industrialize and to profit from the fossil fuel industry, Scotland has contributed far more than other countries to the causes of the climate crisis. And we therefore have a much greater responsibility to cut our emissions faster and support a just transition to a fossil free future. And we also have the resources and the green energy like wind and solar power here in Scotland to help stop global warming, pay for the damage that we have caused to other countries and invest in a renewable green future. And there has been a lot of progress. After huge public pressure, the Scottish government did commit in 2019 to cutting our carbon emissions by 75% by 2030. And that's the minimum that climate science tells us is necessary to avoid catastrophic climate breakdown. And the Scottish government often likes to portray itself as a climate leader, as the host country of COP26 in 2021, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, was awarded with a Cannes International Award for committing £2 million to the Loss and Damage Fund. And after a huge amount of public campaigning, Nicola Sturgeon also said in 2021 that trying to get every single last drop of oil and gas from the North Sea was not sustainable and it was no longer Scottish Government policy. But sadly, since then, there have been some setbacks and Scotland now still has a massive amount that we need to do to break free from fossil fuels. So this week of action is more important than ever because the loss and damage fund that we've contributed to, we've only given a tiny amount of what we actually owe to countries who have been impacted the most by climate breakdown. And there's still, as Tyrone mentioned, this proposal for the enormous Rosebank oil field off the coast of Shetland, which will be the largest undeveloped oil field in the North Sea. It cannot be allowed to go ahead. The Scottish government is also considering proposals for a massive new gas power station in Peterhead in the northeast of Scotland. Peterhead is already Scotland's largest carbon emitter. And if this new gas power station goes ahead, it will massively increase our carbon emissions, it will do nothing to lower our energy bills, and it will stop 
and delay the transition we need away from fossil fuels to green energy. Another key area where we need to make a lot more progress is the influence of the fossil fuel industry over our decision makers, both in Scotland and at Westminster. Research by my colleagues found that fossil fuel lobbyists met with members of the Scottish Parliament almost 800 times since 2018. And there are similar huge problems in Westminster with MPs receiving donations, hospitality from fossil fuel companies and attending events sponsored by the fossil fuel industry. We need to end this corporate capture of our decision makers. Another big area where we need our decision makers to make much more progress is through climate targets. Because in April this year, the Scottish government announced that it is scrapping its climate targets, including the ambition to reduce our emissions by 75% by 2030. This is a huge step back from the government action. And we absolutely need our governments to go much further and take the urgent action we need to prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Another area that is fueling climate injustice is through our pension funds. Across the UK, research by my colleagues at Platform London has discovered that UK councils are investing around 16 billion pounds in fossil fuel companies through their pension funds. And in Scotland, Councils are investing around 2 billion in fossil fuels, and they're funding some of the world's biggest polluters, including BP, Shell, Equinor, which is planning to develop the Rosebank oil field, and also Total Energies, which is a massive French oil giant, and it's one of the com companies behind the East African crude oil pipeline, a fossil fuel project that is already devastating thousands of people across Uganda and Tanzania. And then it just last month, it was revealed that one of the biggest council pension funds in Scotland, the Lothian Pension Fund, has actually increased its fossil fuel investments. And this is despite councillors in Edinburgh and East Lothian voting in 2022 to say that they wanted to divest from fossil fuels. But the good news is that instead of being part of the problem, our pension funds and our institutions can be a massive part of the solution. And it's absolutely vital for Scotland and the UK to pay up and phase out fossil fuels. Because at the moment, by continuing to fund fossil fuel projects and continuing to invest in these big polluters, we are fueling injustice around the world, just as we've been hearing from Assad and Tyrone and Tasneem. And as Assad mentioned, 2024 is predicted to be the hottest year on record. And last year, a UNICEF report revealed that 43 million children have already been displaced by extreme weather just in the past six years. So it's vital for us to block the money pipeline to these fossil fuel companies that are fueling injustice and climate breakdown. And there are lots of ways that we can call on our politicians to take urgent action by phasing out fossil fuels, ending investments in fossil fuel companies, and instead investing in ethical alternatives like wind and solar power and renewable energy. Another great way that politicians can take action is by supporting the International Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And our friends at Global Justice Now are doing an amazing campaign to support this treaty. We also need our governments to say no to climate wrecking projects like Rosebank and the new gas power station in Peterhead. By stopping fossil fuel funding, we can help protect the long-term futures of communities here in the UK and all around the world and ensure a livable future for everybody. And so this week of action and is, is an incredibly exciting opportunity for us to get involved here in the UK and stand in solidarity with communities all around the world. And for this Friday's End Fossil Fuel Day of Action, there are going to be different actions happening in Scotland. We already have confirmed actions for Glasgow on Friday morning, where we'll be calling on one of the UK's biggest council pension funds, the Strathclyde Pension Fund, to stop investing in fossil fuels. 
If you're in Edinburgh on Friday, it would be wonderful if you'd like to come along to a stall and photo action just outside the big art galleries in Princess Street. We're going to have lots of people there from the Stop Rosebank campaign, from the Peterhead campaign, also from Global Justice Now, who'll be talking about the Fossil Fuel Treaty, and we'll be joined by wonderful singers, Protest in Harmony, who are going to lead some climate singing. And if you're in Stirling, there's going to be an amazing photo action with groups including Extinction Rebellion, Christian Climate Action and Friends of the Earth Stirling. But don't worry if you're not in one of these areas, even if you'd like to take a photo with a sign that says, that says end fossil fuels, that would also be incredible. And as Tyrone said, if you'd like to get involved, please feel free to contact me if you're in Scotland or Tyrone and we can help in any way possible. And then next Friday, we're also really excited that there's going to be a special action happening in Edinburgh for the Pay Up for Climate Finance Global Day of Action. We're hoping to have a rally outside the UK government building in Edinburgh and groups including Stop ECOP Edinburgh, Extinction Rebellion Scotland, Global Justice Now Scotland, Stop Rosebank and Friends of the Earth Scotland will be coming together between 12 and two, and we're hoping to have some music, dancing, speeches, and everybody's welcome. And if you'd like to be involved in planning for the action, that would also be incredible. And there are also lots of ways that we can take action beyond this week to call for global solidarity and climate justice by telling the UK government to end our reliance on fossil fuels. You can support the climate justice petition calling on your council to stop funding fossil fuels is another amazing way to get involved, telling the Scottish government to say no to new gas in Peterhead, calling on the prime minister and the first minister of Scotland to support the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and telling your MP to stop Rosebank are all amazing ways you can get involved. And there are lots of wonderful groups across the UK who are taking action, who would love to hear from you. So a massive thank you for everybody, everything that you're doing, a huge thank you to Warren Wants and the Climate Justice Coalition for your incredible campaigning and to Can International for this wonderful organizing for the Week of Action. Thank you so much. Wow, thanks. Thanks so much, Sally. Um, and not just for that, that's 10 minutes, but I think when we were in touch, can't be more than two weeks ago definitely maximum three with the could you help us organize a couple of actions in scotland i uh, didn't expect it to be just as amazing comprehensive uh, across different areas and cities and towns and across both days uh, just it's incredible to have done all that uh, in what two three weeks max so thanks so much for that um and uh, yeah it's just, just just excellent so yeah well Thanks everyone for joining the online rally today. I am gonna put my screen up one more time here um, and we'll leave it for a minute just to really, really emphasize the different ways you can get involved. Uh, first things first is we are gonna be uploading this webinar um, online. It will be on the website there on this QR code from tomorrow morning. Uh, so, you know, if you if this is you to take action get involved want to share things please do share that around with anybody you think may want to see it and it might inspire into action um please do uh share the the map uh consider joining an action have any thoughts about i know it's a bit late in the day but hosting a small action even if it's a little picket whatever it may be do do get in touch please do sign the online petition um because we'll continue to build on that in the lead up to, to cop 29 and um yeah get in touch if you have any other questions or, or want to get involved in in the week of action in any other way but um yeah if, if that's all then i'll leave this up here for another 20 or 30 seconds or so but we'll close the online rally hopefully we'll see you in person at some of the actions hopefully we'll see you posting online um, and hopefully we'll see you in these calls in the future um, as we continue to build momentum up to cop 29 we will be hosting um, more online rallies slash webinars if we're in the lead up to cop 29 um, and then you know throughout the year next year as well we want to continue and engaging people with people with with community uh through through our online rallies and, and webinars so do keep looking out for them as well and do share them around uh, and, and get involved but i will 
stop talking now and send my thanks to all of the panelists for joining today. Um, Tasneem for, 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 for joining as well, not based in the UK, so taking time out of the busy schedule to, to join our call. The attendees for coming, um, Sally, of course, for all the work in Scotland and for joining this call today. Katie for super last minute, um, last second without warning, being plugged into the call and doing a great job. Um, Asad for framing it all so well. And behind the scenes with Angus, coordinator of the Climate Justice Coalition is we make sure that the right people are spotlighted, make sure our slides are working and add in all the useful information into the chat. So massive thank you to Angus as well. Um, but I'll close the call now. Hope everyone has a great Wednesday evening and we'll see you in the streets. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ty. Bye-bye, everyone.